Hi everyone, welcome back to this look at critical media studies, specifically in this video taking a look at feminist analysis. So uh, narrowing in a little more specifically on a particular topic than we have been talking about things like culture and psychoanalysis are a little broader, uh, but now narrowing in on a specific uh, sort of population and perspective when we look at feminist analysis. So let's start off with what do we mean by feminist analysis? Well, Feminist analysis examines artifacts using a framework that considers the ways in which an artifact reinforces or undermines the economic, political, social, and psychological oppression of women. So um, what does that mean? Well, we're again, essentially just taking a look at things from the perspective of femininity and, uh, and how that perspective is different for women for a variety of reasons that, that we'll look at here. First, just a brief bit of history on the feminist movement and what, what we're actually talking about when we talk about feminism. Um, first of all, there are, there are basically three waves of feminism, broad waves of feminism. The first took place in the late 1700s through the early 1900s, which is a long period of time. But then we're really talking about just a general attention that was drawn to the inequality of the sexes during that time. So represented by the U.S. in the um, women's suffrage movement. And just a general recognition that, hey, women have not, not been treated very fairly uh, over history and, and women deserve uh, equal treatment. Now, I would point out that this really focused a lot on um, wealthier white women, uh, women of status who were, who were white, um, which is not uh, out of sync with the rest of American history, really. When we look at American history, the first uh, power structure was really dominated by landowning white men. Uh, and so it's not maybe surprising that the first wave of feminism would focus on women in that similar social structure, women of power, in, in you know, women of means, meaning they were, they were economically fairly well off and had the ability to speak up. And so, um, but really just, again, that first wave of general attention drawn to the inequality of the sexes, the way that they were treated, the way that they were viewed. Uh, and that extended, again, from the early, or sorry, the late 1700s into the early 1900s. Then the second wave really takes place in the early 1960s through the late 1970s, um, in which time we have World War II that right before that had demonstrated the ability of the women to work equally with men. During the war effort, women had to step up and work in um, factories and do work that, that were, was traditionally done by men. And so people started recognizing during that World War II era that, you know, women are, are capable. <laughs> surprise, surprise, right? Women can do things. Women are as capable as men. They're, they're as intelligent as men. They can be as strong as men and so forth. And then, so uh, the period following that, you have these women speaking up and stepping up and saying, look, we really deserve equal treatment. And, and it really coincides with the civil rights movement in the United States. So really a call for, for better treatment of uh, of all people who are proportionately uh, are misrepresented and maybe looked down upon, not just women, but also people of, of color, people, you know, minorities, uh, um, just people in general who, who had been um, minimized in that, in that period of history and through that period of history. So along with the civil rights movement, you have this second wave of feminism, where women saying, look, we stepped up, we are capable of doing this and we deserve equal treatment. Then you have the more recent, the most recent third wave um, that started in really the early 1990s and extends into the present, which, you know, again, it's almost unbelievable that we're, what, you know, 300 years into this and still working on this. But the third wave here really focused on marginalized women. Remember we talked about the first wave, it was really focused on or really limited to um, white women of means, economic means. This third wave, the most recent wave, has really begun to represent and emphasize marginalized women. So women of color, women in lower economic classes who may not have the economic means that the, the first set did, but, uh, but really focusing on those marginalized uh, women in this most recent wave of feminist action and, and the most recent iteration of feminism. So um, in just to provide a really brief history, really brief overview of the history of um, where we're coming from with this uh, discussion. The major premises of feminism include the fact that women are and have been oppressed by the patriarchy, the patriarchy being this, this dominance of men in, in the power structure and in, in, the, in cultures um, throughout history, so that women have traditionally been oppressed by the patriarchy. Uh, also, that Western culture then is deeply rooted in that patriarchal ideology. 
Um, there, there are other cultures that are you know, more patriarchal, but, but Western culture is certainly extremely male-driven in that power structure, male-dominated in terms of positions of power. I mean, you, you just, you know, from a quick example, look at the presidency of the United States. Look at the, you know, not only is it all men, we've never had a woman president, um, but we've also had only uh, one president of a, of a minority race, right? So President Obama, the only non-white, non-Caucasian um, president. Um, so um, not only are we uh, men dominating, but primarily white. And the, again, this is no surprise to anybody who's really been paying attention that Western culture is deeply rooted in this patriarchal hierarchy. Then. Uh, and that while sex is determined by gender, or sorry, Sex is determined by biology. Gender is determined by culture. So when we talk about sex, we're talking about the physical anatomy of a person. Okay? We're talking about their biology. Uh, are they male or female? Again, know that there are some cross um, distinctions there, but uh, but we're, you know broadly categorizing people who are born and anatomically speaking, male or female. We primarily then at their reproductive organs to, to identify that. That's what we mean by sex. Gender, however, when we talk about gender, we're talking about masculine and feminine, which is not determined by uh, biology. It's determined by culture. Gender is a social construct. We determine as a society what constitutes masculinity, what constitutes femininity. And we have over history, and as we, we look back over history, those things have changed. You know, what it means to quote unquote, be masculine or be feminine. Uh, has changed over time with our culture and varies from culture to culture. So these things are social constructs, not biological constructs. Okay, so sex is biology, but but um, gender is determined by culture and is a is a social construct. So we we'll look at those things crossing over and keep those terms in mind as we move forward. And then finally, uh, whether we're consciously aware of those gender issues, uh, they play a part in every aspect of human production and experience, including the production and experience of artifacts and in, including the production and experience of media, right? So keep things in mind, like uh, the fact that communication, um, communicating through a medium, for example, is different than communicating face to face. So there are different tools that are involved um, in, in communicating through a medium. First of all, you have barriers to entry. Not everybody has access to the same level of, of uh, media exposure that, that other people do, right? Or, or control of those things. Now, this is, you know, we're seeing a shift in this a little bit through things like social media, through things like what I'm doing here, just independently producing this, you know, from my home. It's, it's uh, something that years ago would have been unheard of. But we still do have those, as we discussed in a previous video, the big six, the six organizations that really control the vast majority of the media, mass media that is produced in the United States. And there are barriers to entry there. You look at the, the heads of those, um, the big six uh, organizations and corporations and people are making decisions, people are controlling that media, still predominantly white men. So there are barriers to entry for women and for, for um, all people of minority, really. Um, and then there's a disinhibition effect that, that takes place and, and people get brave on the other side of a, of a screen. And so that affects the way that we communicate through a medium. We also have um, this idea that media um, is more than just a channel of communication, that it encourages and discourages some types of interaction, um, it really encourages asynchronous communication and discourages face-to-face -face communication in some ways, um, which uh, favors people who have access to that and who have uh, been able to develop those skills uh, over time. Uh, so I mean, there's things like that. There's, you know, every medium is different. There's, there's just ways that th th this system has really been developed by the people in power, which again, white men have been in power. And so uh, that, that structure, that organizational uh, culture is predisposed toward those folks. It's made easier for uh, people in that situation, as we've discussed in, in other videos as well, that the fact that white men have controlled the media, they've set it up in a way that makes it easier for them to control. And that's a natural thing to do, but it creates barriers to entry, creates barriers to um, creativity and expression for people who are not in that dominant power structure. So and whether we're con conscious of it or not, that pervades every aspect of media creation, right? Media creation, when you look at, again, the people who control those organizations, predominantly white men, most of the people um, directing 
and really controlling those media, even at a, at a creative level, are white men. Think about, you know, film directors, predominantly white men. Uh, we're seeing some entry, but uh, but the, we know that it's not um, significant because of the fact that we point out all the time, oh, that's a, that's a, that, that director is African-American. That's significant, right? Or that director is a woman. The fact that we point these out in, in the sense of what we've talked about before, othering in that sense, that means that it's, that it's uh, rare enough that, um, that it's still very much predominantly white men that we note those things. So anyway, every aspect of this is really um, uh, affected by gender issues. Okay, let's look at some of the common questions that we get into with feminist analysis. First, what is the, how is the relationship between, betrayed? How is the relationship between men and women portrayed? Let's try it that way. How is the relationship portrayed? Is it, uh, you know, we look at old timey movies back in the early days and it's very much men are in control. Men are saving the day. Men are going to work. Women are really in the background. They're there to take care of the home. They're there to provide emotional support. But how is that relationship portrayed in the artifact that we're looking at? Uh, has, has that been updated to a more accurate uh, portrayal or not? Uh, what are the power relationships between men and women? Can, following along there, the same kind of idea. Men have been in this power seat for years and years and years. So is, is that what's illustrated? Uh, and is it supportive of the patriarchy in that sense? Or is it contradicting this? How are the male and female roles defined? Again, it's very clear differentiation between male and female roles and, and masculine and gender roles, what the men were supposed to do, what the women were supposed to do, how they were supposed to behave um, in these older, older films. Has, has that been crossed up? Has it been, um, is, is there more androgyny or more um, uh, cross, uh, crossing over of men portraying feminine attributes and women portraying masculine attributes? And how are those roles defined in this artifact? What constitutes masculinity and femininity, femininity? What makes up these things? And how do these characters embody these traits? Uh, we additionally ask things like, do the characters take on traits from opposite genders? And if so, how does that change others' reactions to them, right? Do they take on, do, do we have women taking on more masculine traits and vice versa, men taking on more feminine traits? If so, how do the characters relate to that? How does the audience relate to that? How does it affect um, the way that they're viewed, the way that they're um, seen and, and, and uh, related to in this, in this piece? What does the work reveal about the operations, both economically, politically, socially, or psychologically, of the uh, patriarchy? Is it, again, supportive of this idea of a patriarchy and the, and the, the dominance of men, and particularly white men? Or is it uh, questioning that? Does it represent different views and represent different outlooks on these things? What does the history of the work's reception by the public and the critics tell us about the operation of patriarchy? Again, how does the audience respond to this piece? Um, are they um, comfortable with it in that it supports the patriarchy or are they um, uh, questioning it because it supports that patriarchy or they, uh, or because it supports, uh, you know, disputes the patriarchy uh, are they uh, supportive of that? Then? Um, or how, and so how does the work receptions by the audience, uh, t what does that tell us about uh, how this fits into the patriarchy and how it, uh, how the patriarchy is established and how it's currently working in our society? And then what role does the work play in terms of women's artistic history and artistic tradition? So when we look at um, women entering these media in particular, or, or the feminist perspective entering these media, how does that fit in? How does this work fit into that? How does it contribute to that? How does it uh, counteract that? Um, and these, these uh, artistic histories and traditions then. Okay, with these questions in mind, I wanted to just do a brief little uh, analysis just to give you an example of something that we could look at here. Uh, and I chose the Harry Potter uh, world, I guess. We could, you could look at it as the books or the movies. I think they're fairly uh, close in, in these things. So, uh, But I just wanted to look at the work of Harry Potter. It's very well known, and uh, so it gives us a good uh, reference point for these things. So looking again at these questions, uh, how does the relationship between men and women portrayed? I'm actually going to look at both these first couple of questions together. The power relationships between men and women. Um, it's fairly traditional, I think, in the Harry Potter series. Um, we have not only is the hero uh, male, right, and fairly masculine in the uh, controlling his emotions and things like that, and pulling things up that you know what we would expect of of a uh, male um, hero, so to speak. But <clears throat> most of the other characters as well in the 
the movie of power are male. So you have Dumbledore's, the head of Hogwarts, the main bad guys, the man of Voldemort. Um, the, most of the um, central characters are men, the people who are driving the story. You have some exceptions. Hermione's a wonderful character. Um, but as we'll get into this, she really is subordinate to Harry and almost to Ron in a lot of ways in these in this series. Right? That, that she's not the... She's got the best ideas, probably, but she's not the primary decision maker. She's not the primary driver of decisions. Same with Professor McGonagall, who's a, a wonderful character and a good representation, but um, but she really is subordinate in most instances to uh, the, the patriarchal power structure. So a fairly traditional um, representation of power in these relationships in the Harry Potter series. Are the male and female roles defined? Um, they're, they're pretty defined traditionally, I think. Um, so um, they, they, there's not a lot of straying over uh, in these things. Um, so uh, I think the, the male and female characters fall pretty pretty much straight down the line in terms of masculine and feminine representation. Again, I think you could make a case for um, uh, Hermione displaying some masculine traits as uh, you know somebody who's... Um, Presented as capable and strong, strong-willed, and making her own decisions. Those are those are seen in our culture as more masculine traits, and she's imbued with some of those. But uh, uh, but for the most part, they fall pretty much straight down the line. Uh, the, the men tend to be in charge and getting in trouble and getting in adventures, and the women tend to be falling in love with the men. Right, <laughs> and the, for the most part. Uh, what constitutes masculinity and femininity? Again, I think fairly traditional. Men acting as men, women acting as as women in these roles. Um, so I don't. There's a lot to really look at there other than the fact that say that it's pretty traditional, I think. Do characters take on traits from opposite genders? I kind of touched on this a little bit. I think Hermione does represent some um, uh, masculine traits. I can, she gets accused and continuing on with that. How so? And how does this change others' reactions to them? She is seen as, as bossy and take charge, right, in some ways. And um, headstrong, which we would define as a lot of times as masculine traits, and gets a lot of flack for it. Right? She gets, I mean, she's kind of um, excluded from some things. She's, she's looked down upon, not only because she's of a different background, but uh, being a, you know, uh, uh, having muggle, muggle parents, so to speak, right? But, uh, uh, but also for being who she is. And, and despite she's not behaving like the other girl, she's not interested in, in chasing the boys, right? And developing those kinds of relationships. So she's kind of, um, separated from um, a lot of the other female characters in that regard as well. So um, is ostracized a little bit because of that. So, but I think you see some of that. You can also see a little bit of that in Professor McGonagall uh, and vice versa. I think you see um, Professor Dumbledore taking on some feminine traits. Um, there's been some um, kind of question from, uh, or some uh, inference from J.K. Rowling that, that Dumbledore may be gay. So maybe that's why, but you do see, I mean, you see him, acting in a caring way, in a concerned way, in a, in a compassionate way, which we would typically define as, as feminine traits. So um, so we do see some people taking on uh, traits of other uh, genders, but for the most part, it's pretty, again, pretty traditional in the gender representation in these series. What does the work reveal about the operations of the patriarchy? I think, um, especially being that this is a work from from the UK, which is very buttoned up, very uh, straight down the middle in terms of gender roles for the most part, um, even probably more so than the United States, um, which is saying something because we're pretty buttoned up too. Uh, but it does reveal the strength of the patriarchy in that culture, I think, um, and the 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 notion of of being British and, and being you know, pretty strictly masculine and feminine, so to speak. What is the history of the work's reception by the public and the critics tell us about the operation of the patriarchy? Um, again, it's very well received, obviously incredibly popular, um, and tells us that people are comfortable with that patriarchy. That, that I think in part that um, the fact that it does fall straight down those lines in terms of male and female representation of masculinity and femininity um, gives us a pretty good idea that the, the public is generally comfortable with that, that it fits into our mindset of that patriarchy, um, probably more than um, some other stories that may veer from from that strict representation a little bit, that this was a little more uh, comfortable in that regard. What role does the work play in terms of women's artistic history and artistic tradition? I do think this is interesting. That um, well, First of all, the rise of J.K. Rowling as a, as a female, art, female author in this era, in this area uh, of not only um, science 
uh, fiction and fantasy type books, but also um, in the sense of uh, the, uh, sort of the, the, what they call the tweener books or the ad- you know, books for adolescents geared toward them, which hit a lot of adults as well. I read them as an adult, but really were geared more toward um, those, and then the people in the adolescent stage. Uh, did open up a lot of doors, not only in, in that genre in general, but for women in that genre. You look then at the, the number of women who've been able to excel in that field based on the success, I think, of J.K. Rowling. She opened a lot of doors in that regard uh, and has since then, I think, tried to leverage a little bit of the um, sort of the power that she has gained from that into um, being a little more um, out of the mainstream in terms of, you know, again, talking about how she couldn't really at the time say that Dumbledore was gay in these books and in these movies, but since then has implied that he maybe was and and maybe opened those doors a little bit to what people love Dumbledore. And if, if that was the case, then okay, we still love him, you know, so um, has taken advantage of some of those maybe. So I think it has had an impact on the, um, the progression of um, the acceptance of women in not only that genre, but just in general in, in the arts and recognition that they have a lot to offer, obviously. So, okay, that was a really simple, really quick overview of how we might apply some of those questions in feminist analysis. I hope that this has been helpful for you in understanding this critical lens. Again, one more thing to add to our arsenal in critical media studies, a different kind of lens that we can look at and say, Okay, this is a different way that we can examine this artifact. If you have questions about feminist uh, analysis or anything else related to critical media studies, please feel free to contact me, uh, email me. I'd love to hear from you and uh, discuss these items further. In the meantime, I hope that you will add this critical lens and begin to look at some of the, the media that we take in through the eyes of feminism and through the eyes of feminist analysis and and the feminist representation and just gender representation in general in these artifacts.